So, I am Godfrey. You can find me on the internet as Chen Ken Colt. Um, she mentioned I am on the Rails core team, but um, you should take note that that fact does not add anything to my presentation, and particularly it does not add any credibility to what I'm about to tell you today. <laughs> and it is very important that you remember that. <laughs> um, if you're interested in Rails, or particularly contributing to Rails, I help run a newsletter called This Week in Rails. You can find it on that website. Um, it gets sent out every Friday. And I hope that's not my computer. But anyway. Um, so yes, um, you can also find the content, content on uh, the Rails blog every Friday. Um, you should subscribe. Um, new relic. Uh, let me do this thing. I do have audio. Let me just quit this app. You could do do not disturb on your notification. I just turned that on. Hopefully, the combination of both would be enough. Otherwise, I don't know where that's coming from. Um, okay, so um, thank you, New Relic, for having us here. Um, I don't actually work for New Relic. I work for a local company called Tilder. Um, I actually have business cards, but I forgot to bring them. So this is a picture of my business card. <laughs> you can. Uh, we coincidentally have a product, but uh, I would like us to continue to have pizza. So I should pr probably not mention that product. But in any case, um, as you can see, it's blurred out, so you can see it. Um, <laughs> It turns out that I have a referral link, so if you sign up using this link, I will get a lot of money, and I will be very rich, so you should consider doing that. Um, and uh, I heard the key to a great presentation is to have images of, anim like animated GIFs of cats, so I have an... <laughs> Um, so anyway, uh, yes, this is actually my second day in Portland. Um, it's pretty crazy so far because a few days ago I was in another country very far away called Canada, and in particular, um, I live in a city called Vancouver. Apparently, there's another Vancouver around here, but that is not the same Vancouver. Um, I, it, it, I'm pretty sad that I have to leave. Vancouver, but I heard there are a lot of cool things that the city has to offer, so we'll see how that goes. But um, um, I was actually, I actually became a Canadian citizen not that long ago, and when I became um, a Canadian citizen, I had to shake hands with like a citizenship judge, and he gave me a very important um, responsibility. Um, he told me that now that I am a Canadian, I am a face of a nation, so. I should always look out for opportunities to promote our country. So I <laughs> thought I would just um, tell you a little bit about Canada. And uh, that is actually a responsibility that I take very seriously. As you can see, this is um, Conan O'Brien doing his show. And um, up there in the audience, you can see me holding a Canadian flag. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so Canada, um, it, as it turns out, it's pretty different from the States. Um, this is a great example to show the differences in our values. Um, <laughs> as you can see, this is how you report temperatures in America. And you probably know this, but um, in case you don't, the F here stands for freedom. and. <laughs> The system is called the degrees of freedom. <laughs> and on the other hand, in Canada, we use a different system. And the C stands for Canada, obviously. <laughs> um, so like when you want to use it in a sentence, that's how you say it. Um, we also have a very 
vibrant healthcare industry because we have a pretty good healthcare system. So if you go to Vancouver, this is what the skyline looks like. <laughs> they, uh, those are all luxury hotel uh, hospital buildings in downtown. Um, and we are also apparently the second largest country in the world, so we have a lot of land. If you go to Vancouver, you'll notice that, for example, a parking slot are very wide. <laughs> um, I figure you probably won't believe me if I tell you this car is actually parked, so I had a picture from a different angle. <laughs> As you can see, there's no driver in the car. The car is definitely parked in the shopping mall. In fact, I went away for lunch, and I had my lunch, and I came back to the parking lot. The car is still there. And there are no tickets for some reason. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's how Canadian rolls. But I figure it would be pretty bad if I actually know this person or this person sees the presentation on the internet. They might get upset that I put a picture of the car, so I made sure I blur the license plate. <laughs> as, you, as you can now clearly see, it is blurred. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about JavaScript. <laughs> um, you know, we all love Ruby, that's why we're here. But deep down, we all know it. Unlike JavaScript, Ruby is not web scale. Every once in a while, you will need to get really close to metal. And for that, you have no choice, but you will have to use JavaScript. Let's talk about what makes JavaScript so fast. Um, that's right, the secret is in the syntax. You see, JavaScript has a very fast and powerful syntax. I will give you an example. JIT hints. Most Whoa. JavaScript runtimes have a just-in-time compiler to make things very fast. But um, the JavaScript syntax allows you to drop some hints for the compiler to make things even faster. For example, let's say you have a triangle here. You know the length of the two, two sides. Um, let's say you know what A and B is, and you want to find out what's the length of C. You might remember this triangle formula from your high school geometry classes. Um, basically, the way you calculate the length of C is to compute like square root A squared plus B squared. So let's implement that in JavaScript. First, you probably write a function that computes a square of any given number. And then you would use that to implement the triangle formula square root a square plus the square of B, so far so good. Um, what might be very obvious to you is that these functions are intended to take numbers as input, but that is um, because JavaScript is a weakly type language, that is not a safe assumption for a compiler to make. So, um, so what you can do is you can sprinkle a few lines of code in there, um, and your code automatically become faster. Specifically, um, you can throw in these unary plus signs in there and to force like the number as a, like force an input to be a number and the compiler sees that and it's like, okay, it's safe to make my optimization and suddenly your code is 5% faster. Uh, <laughs> so, I figured you might not believe me, so I made a chart. As you can see, um, it is much faster, but um, the x-axis also didn't start from zero. Personally, that seems fine, but if you insist, here is what it would look like if you start from zero. Um, so as you can see, that is just one very quick example, but you already, like it already shows you how um, JavaScript has such a powerful syntax. So that got me thinking, um, if we can combine the JavaScript syntax, which is very fast, with the Ruby virtual machine, which is um, full of magic, <laughs> then um, we basically get the best of both worlds. So if you are immediately sold after this quick introduction, you can already get the code right now. You can run gem install JavaScript on your computer, <laughs> and you can try it. You can run and like you can run the code, and you can stop listening to me. But for the rest of you, we'll look into 
how to build this gem together, if that's okay for you. Ah, but before that, let's talk about Java for a moment. Hypothetically, let's say you have a hello world program written in Java. Um, it's okay if you don't know Java. This is basically the simplest hello world example in Java from the Java website. So what do you think would happen if we call this file java.rb and we try to run it with the Ruby interpreter? Uh, do you think it would just work? <laughs> Or would it give you a syntax error? Or would it give you a runtime error? So what do you think? Let's vote. Who thinks it is A? OK. We have a very shy crowd here. Um, it is OK. Um, who thinks it is B? OK. We're getting there. Who thinks it is C? OK we have a pretty even split between B and C. So it turns out the correct answer is a syntax error. But what does that even mean? <laughs> to understand that, we need to understand how Ruby works. From your perspective, you just write some code, and then like you just write some Ruby code, and then you throw it at the interpreter, and it runs them for you. Seems pretty simple. But what is happening under the hood at a very high level of abstraction is that it is actually a two-step process. The first step is for the interpreter to understand your code at a syntactical level, which um, we call parsing. Once it understood what the structure of your code is trying to communicate, it will proceed to actually running the code for you. Um, if at the parsing step the interpreter thinks that your code is so broken that it can't, it can't even begin to understand it, it will refuse to continue and throw a syntax error, as we just saw. Um, obviously, since your code is not even running in the interpreter, a syntax error is not something that you can rescue from and recover from within the code that caused the error. On the other hand, if the interpreter basically understands the structure of your code at a syntactical level, um, but it found problems with it later on at execution time, it will give you a runtime error. This is probably something you're more familiar with. Perhaps it is a divide by zero error, or if it maybe it's a no method error. But um, anyway, that's something that you're probably more used to dealing with. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, and that is something you can anticipate and rescue from and uh, recover within the code that caused the error. So enough about Ruby. Let's talk about JavaScript. Hypothetically, you have a Hello World program written in JavaScript. What do you think would happen if you call this JavaScript.rb and try to run it with Ruby? Do you think it would just work? a syntax error, or would it give you a runtime error? Who thinks it is A? OK, B, C. OK, we have the entire room almost. <laughs> that is correct. It turns out that running that JavaScript code in the Ruby interpreter gives you a runtime error. This is great news, because now your code is running inside the Ruby interpreter. That means that you can recover from the error within the code that caused it. Um, to do that, we first have to understand how Ruby looks at our code. So I don't know about you, but this doesn't seem like Ruby code to me. Um, but it turns out that it is a plausible piece of Ruby code if you look at it with the right um, angle. Specifically, the Ruby, the Ruby interpreter thinks that you're probably trying to look up a local variable or call method called console, and then you're taking the result of that variable lookup or method call and call another method called log on that object, whatever it is. And as we know, parentheses are optional in Ruby, so we can basically just ignore them. And we are passing a single argument to the log method in this case, the string literal hello world. And at the end, we have a semicolon, which is also optional in Ruby, so we can ignore it. Look at error again. Um, Ruby is basically complaining that it doesn't know what console is referring to. So that's easy enough to fix. We 
can basically define a class with, like you can call it anything, but it has to have um, a method called lock because you're going to call it later. And then we'll assign an instance of that class to a local variable called console. So now this console thing refers to that object we created, and then we're calling a method called lock on that object with the string hello world, which we then just pass it to the puts method, which prints it to the screen. So if you run this program again, you will see that um, it is doing what we expected. And with that, we have successfully executed a first line of JavaScript in Ruby. Success. <laughs> um, if you look closely, though, this is not ideal um, for, for one thing. We are leaking um, a top-level variable, and we're mixing the Ruby code, like the setup code, with uh, the JavaScript code. So in order to run JavaScript, you have to first type a bunch of Ruby code. Um, that seems odd. Ideally, what we want to do is we keep the, all the boilerplate code inside a file that we require, um, and then maybe we can wrap the JavaScript code in a block so it's clear what's happening. Um, in other words, we are trying to write a domain-specific language in Ruby. Fortunately, this is a fairly well-established frontier in the Ruby community. If you have used Rake or RSpec, or even if you use Rails, browse.rb in your app, it's, and like they, those are all examples of DSLs in Ruby. And the number one weapon for writing Ruby DSL is instant exec, which lets you take a block and runs it on, um, in the context of an arbitrary object. In other words, you can change what the self pointer is pointing to inside the block that you're executing. So we can use that to refactor our code to get to where we want it. Um, so every time we want to execute a block of JavaScript code, we can create, um, here we define a class called context. Um, the name is, again, unimportant, but it has an instance variable, instance method called console. So every time we're trying to run, when we try to run JavaScript block, we'll pass that um, to, we run that on an instance of the context object. And because Ruby allows us to omit the self keyword when you're um, calling methods on the same object, object, then the console in this case would just refer to the console method, which gives you um, an instance of the console class that we wrote earlier. So if you run this code, it now works as expected. And we have um, wrapped our boilerplate code inside a file that we require, so we don't have to look at that to you all the time. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> Let's talk about variables. So this is how you define variables in JavaScript, um, var message equals hello world. So what do you think would happen when we now put it inside our JavaScript DSL block, and then we require the boilerplate file run that in Ruby? Do you think it would just work and print hello world? Or do you think it would give you a syntax error, a no method error, or maybe a name error? Um, before you decide, I would like to point out that no method error and name errors are specific examples of runtime errors. So basically, for the rest of the talk, you can assume anything that's not a syntax error is like a, a runtime error. So let's do this. Who is voting for A? B? C? D? OK. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so the correct answer is C, but if you voted for D, don't be too upset because you're still technically correct because um, no method error is a subclass of name error. So, uh, <laughs> but anywho, like we don't really care what the error is because we are going to fix it, but. Um, the great news is we're getting a runtime error here, so we can do something about that. So let's get to it. Um, let's look at how Ruby sees our code again. Once again, this doesn't quite look like Ruby, but it turns out that is also a plausible piece of Ruby code. Um, 
specifically, Ruby assumed that we're trying to call a method called var here, which we can make easier to comprehend by adding the optional parentheses. Um, again, they are completely optional, but with the parentheses, hopefully you can more clearly see that we are calling a method var with some stuff inside there. And once again, semicolon is optional, so we can ignore it. Um, parentheses are option, also optional. And so we are basically calling a var method with, um, ah, okay, there's a string literal there, and then we are assigning that to a local variable called message, and then we are calling the method var with, with the result of that. And it turns out that um, in Ruby, the value of an assignment expression is the value being assigned. So basically the thing on the right hand side. So we can basically rewrite this as we first assign hello world to a local variable called message and then we call a method var with message, which in this case points to the string hello world. Um, and as you can see, Ruby doesn't require any special syntax for declaring a local variable. So the first line already sufficiently accomplished what we wanted to do here. So we don't actually need um, the var method to do anything. We just need it to not blow up. So looking at the error message again, Ruby is complaining that we don't have a method called var that is easy enough to fix. In our context class, we can just add a method var that doesn't do anything. And now if you run this piece of code again, it would do everything you expect and it would print hello world to the console. So that's pretty great. <laughs> um, let's talk about uninitialized un initialized variables. In JavaScript, it is possible to declare a variable without initializing it to anything. So here you have var message and you don't assign a value to it right away. So what do you think would happen when you run this piece of code? Do you think it would just work? Syntax error, um, no method error, or name error. So A, B, C, D. Okay, seems like everyone <laughs> is very confused at this point. <laughs> um, it turns out that we are getting a name error this time. Why is that? Well. Since we never defined a local variable called message before the first line, Ruby assumed that we're trying to call a method called message here, which we can again make clearer by inserting the optional parentheses. And then we pass the result of this method called to var. Um, and on the second line, we actually do a regular local variable assignment. So as you can see again, we don't have to declare any variables before using it, so the first line is completely unnecessary in Ruby, and we just have to make it not blow up. So that's easy enough to fix. Um, again, the, mess, the, the error message is complaining that we don't have a method called message here, so we just, net, we just need to define that. Um, obviously, we can just define a method called message, but that would be cheating because we really want to be able to use any um, arbitrarily named variables. So fortunately, Ruby provided a way to handle undefined method calls like that. Um, all we have to do is define method missing on our context, context class. Um, once again, it doesn't, doesn't even have to do anything. It just have to suppress the error we get when we call undefined methods. So that seems good. And um, <laughs> if you now run this piece of code, it would do exactly what you expect and print hello world to the console. So that's great. <laughs> Let's talk about functions. Um, this is how you define a function in JavaScript. Function hello, uh, parentheses followed by the function body. What do you think would happen here? Um, the usual options. So who think it is A? B, C, D, okay. Um, unfortunately, this is actually a trick question. <laughs> the correct answer is nothing happens. Why is that? As you can see on the right, when you run it, there's no errors, but there's no output either. So we need to figure out why. Um, first of all, let's look at how Ruby sees our code. 
So again, we'll start from the right to the left. Um, first of all, Ruby thinks that we're invoking a method called hello, and then we are not passing any arguments to it, as you can see from the empty parentheses. Um, but we are passing a block argument to this function, to this method called hello. Um, this is, like if you're not familiar with this, this is the same thing as hello, do, and whatever, right? Like so there are two ways to call, to pass blocks in Ruby. One is do, and which is probably more common, one just curly braces, so this is what is happening here. Um, and finally, we are passing the result of this hello method to, um, to a method called function. So we can rearrange things a little bit to make it look more like Ruby. This is identical to the last line, or we can even break it up further. So this is probably more similar to the Ruby code that you usually write, and it is, you can take my word for it, that is identical to uh, what we have from the last slide, except we introduced a temporary variable. So this is pretty strange because we never defined these methods called hello and function, how do things work? Uh, it turns out that we are being trolled by our own code because we <laughs> defined this thing called method missing earlier that silently swallow all errors. Um, so we can fix that. Um, this is what I came up with, I'll walk you through it. Um, like I said before, Ruby start from the right to the left, so it thinks that you're calling hello with a block. Um, since we don't have a method called hello, it will hit method missing, and then it will see that, ah, we have a block argument, so we are probably trying to define a function in JavaScript, so let's define it as a singleton method on this current object. And then Ruby will call the function method with the result of our method missing. Um, it turns out it doesn't really matter what we return from there because we don't care, um, so we, I just defined an empty method called function that does nothing. Um, so finally, when we invoke the function hello, um, we already have a real method defined on the object called hello, so it would just invoke our block and it would do everything we expected. So with that, we have taught JavaScript how to, um, how, we have taught Ruby how to define and execute JavaScript functions. So that's pretty cool. And um, functions is not very useful if they can't take arguments. So this is how you define a function that take arguments in JavaScript. What do you think would happen when we try to run this piece of code? So I, I will give you all five options this time. <laughs> Who thinks it is A? B, C, D, or E. Okay. Well. <laughs> uh, uh, well. <laughs> I'm glad that I got you thinking about these completely useless problems, but unfortunately, I'm out of time, so you would have to figure it out yourself. <laughs> Um, there is actually the, the gem that I mentioned at the beginning actually handles all these cases and a lot more things and there are a lot of cool stuff in there that I would like to show you but 30 minutes is not a long time so maybe we'll go to the regular Tuesday thing and then we can talk about it. Um, you can find a code on the internets on GitHub. It is also linked to from the Ruby Gems page so you will like it will be pretty easy for you to find it. Um, and we even have tests to help you understand the code. And you can read the tests and make, you will know that things are working correctly. Um, at this point, you're probably wondering why. <laughs> uh, clearly, this is completely useless and you'll be right. But why not? <laughs> um, as programmers, we're too often, far too often caught up with building useful things, and it is easy to forget to have fun sometimes. And uh, we probably all started programming because it was 
fun to build stuff on the computer, and it is very important to not lose that passion. So um, this is basically me coming up with a ridiculous idea on a Saturday and playing like a single player mode called ping pong. Um, and that was pretty amusing. It's almost embarrassing to admit. But <laughs> anyway, I actually learned a surprising amount of stuff about Ruby and JavaScript from doing this exercise. Um, for example, did you know how Ruby distinguish between a local variable lookup and a method call when you don't use parentheses? Or do you know what happens when you try to use the return keyword from a block? These are not things that um, I started, like I expected to learn, but they just happen organically along the way. And surprisingly, I can actually point you to real places in the Rails code base where these things has helped me to understand what is going on or even fix bugs sometimes. So um, these particular piece of knowledge might not be very interesting, but my point is you will probably learn unexpected things by doing stupid and useless things like this. Um, and uh, so I guess my point is you should go to the Tuesday thing and bring your computer and do some useless things and have some have fun. Um, but it doesn't actually have to be useless. You can build a lot of cool things that is fun. But again, the point is you should try to have some fun sometimes. And if nothing else comes out of it, you can at least go to meetups and tell people about your useless <laughs> things. So um, there's one more thing. If you happen to enjoy this talk, you might also want to check out <laughs> this other gem. Uh, it lets you program like a true Canadian programmer would. And uh, that's all I have. And uh, finally, please remember, if Chen can code, then so can you. Thank you very much. Yeah.